exciting. I just want to just uh, let you guys know, though, that we are, uh, just to kind of get back on track of things um, for, for the message today, we've been talking about a series, we've been going through a series talking about the presence of God versus the presence that we receive. And so much of, of what we've been sharing has been all about actually being in that presence, being in that place or where we don't have to worry about the circumstances that we're in because we know that God's got things in control. Um, we know that, that God um, is, is watching out for us and, and regardless of what other people may think of us, that, that pressure, those, 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 those things that we are talked over or whatever, we can stay in the presence of God. And then we just got to hear an amazing message from Andy last week on just the humanity of Jesus and just hearing about who Jesus is uh, from his friend, uh, John. It's been, it's been an awesome, awesome series, and just love being here, being able to share some of it, being able to hear it as well. Today, I'm going to flip it a little bit, because we've been talking a lot about receiving, and I mean, we all like to be given gifts, uh, but uh, I just want I just to know, as we get started on this, though, who still has shopping to do for, for Christmas? Yeah, a few of you? Yeah, good. Ray, Awesome. Yeah, I haven't gotten mine yet from you, so I'm, I'm waiting. But no, anyway, there are still people that, that, that we're shopping for. And I just got to tell you, for myself, I'm a really hard person to shop for. Jill can attest to this. I don't know if, if you also know people that are really hard to shop for, but I'm one of those people that it's easier to get me a gift card than it is to try to find something for me to try to, try to find something. Because I will share with people, this is, this is what I want, this exact thing, this size, nothing else, nothing more. And if there's anything that's deviated from that, I'm going, thanks for the comforter. <laughs> if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I talked about my lamest gift, and that was it. It was a comforter. But, uh, so I'm a hard person to shop for. But I, I thought about this. I'm like, who would be the absolute hardest person to shop for? And I, 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 I got to tell you, I think that it would be Jesus. You know, because if you're thinking about what kind of a gift could you bring to the creator of all things, it's kind of hard to find that perfect gift. It's not going to be flowers. It's not going to be chocolate, although that's a good one. But see, he's created everything. He can speak it, and it's there. So what in the world do you bring to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And uh, I just think of this one gift that we actually each of us, individually and uniquely, what we can bring to the Lord is this. I believe that the one gift that Jesus wants from us, and the only one that we can give, is our worship. We can give our worship. Individually, uniquely, it is something very special, very intimate, and very, uh, very you that you can bring to Jesus is your worship. I want to read Matthew 2 today, uh, verses 1 and 2. And it, it's... Uh, it's the passage of scripture from the Christmas stuff going on here. And uh, this is what it says. Chapter 2. So I'm flipping through my Bible. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star, and it rose, um, when it rose, and have come to worship him. So, I want to just talk about the Magi today, these, 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 these kings. You know, we sing about, we three kings of Orient are. Fact of the matter is, we don't know how many kings or Magi there were. Scripture isn't clear as to how many. We just make that assumption because of the three gifts that they bring, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it's awesome to, to think about uh, what those gifts uniquely represented, but Honestly, that's just a, a clever and cool um, illustration that pastors have come up over the years to, to just kind of say, this is what they represent, the, the kingliness of gold, the, the, the um, incense of, of, worshiping, of worshiping God, and then the, the, the myrrh as, as representing what, what his death will be bringing and, and all that stuff. Those are, those are great things. But these guys were coming to give honor, to give... Uh, uh, homage to this new king that they had seen. Now, it could have been that there was a king that they were representing, that they were bringing these gifts from, or it could have been that these are actually kings that said, we want to come and, and we want to bring these, these tributes to this new king. 
This is something that was very customary in this day and, day and age, that, that people would come to uh, bring these gifts to a new king or to bring gifts uh, at, just in, in this to, to honor a king that, that was in place. But what these guys did is that they saw the star in the east and they came to worship him. Well, what has worship become to us? Maybe it's just a song. We sing these songs like, Come and worship, come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. And you're going, what's that mean? It's a great word. Worship is an amazing word. I love to sing songs about the Lord. But, but what has worship become? Is it, is it something that, that worship is, is a raising of hands? We joke about this. It, you, you can watch uh, funny, funny videos of comedians on YouTube that talk about different ways charismatic people raise their hands in worship, you know, carrying the TV. It's a big one. Or I caught a fish this big. You know, uh, whatever it is that, that uh, maybe, maybe it is, you know, worship is, is something of how we express that, or it, it's, we talk about having a worship service. So we come in and, and we have that time where we, we gather to sing songs, to, to read in the word, to, to, to do all these things. There's all sorts of things, but of, of what worship is, but is there more? Is there more to worship? When we talk about this word, you know, when they come to worship him, the word is proskuneo. And that means to bow down or kneel, to fall flat, to do reverence, to adore, to worship. So they are, they are coming before Jesus, and they are presenting their gifts, but they're not only just presenting their gifts, they are, they are presenting all that they are. They are, they are coming down, they're, they're bending their knee, they're saying, you are king. You are above all else. And that's a, that's, a, that's a big thing. And especially for our culture in America, it's like, I'm not going to bow down to anybody. I didn't vote for you. I'm out. You know? Nobody's going nobody's gonna to tell me to do that. I'm not going to submit to anyone, anything, any, anywhere. And so it's a very unique thing. We talk about worship, what that actually, um, what that actually does. And so I want to just talk about three reasons to worship Jesus this Christmas. Three reasons why we should worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the first one is that we need to worship Jesus for who he is. We need to worship Jesus for who he is. In Matthew 1, 21 through 23, it says this, Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the guy born in this, in this lowly place, this humble beginning of a child. He would be the savior of all mankind, the savior of all humanity. He would save his people from their sins. And when somebody has those sins, they are separated from God forever. And so there's this, there's this complete separation for all humanity from relationship with God. But Jesus, in coming to earth and living this life, obe- obe- being obedient to God the Father, and then sacrificing himself, willingly going and being that, that sacrifice for you and for me, we now have opportunity to um, have new relationship with God, restored relationship with God. He is our Savior. And also, when it talks about Emmanuel, that means that he is God with us. I don't know if this has ever been something that you've just kind of thought about, tried to process, because it is kind of a, a, a lofty thing to think about, that we serve the, the God who, who came to earth, who loved us so deeply, so passionately, he was so compelled to come and be with us. The creator of all things. The one who said, let there be light, and there was light. The one who said, let there be birds, there were birds. This creator of all things, who breathed life into man, said, I love man so much that I will do whatever I can to restore relationship. 
And I want to just share with you some of the other names, the other things that, that, that Jesus is. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the bread of life, the bridegroom, the chief cornerstone, deliverer, good shepherd, indescribable gift. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the light of the world, the mediator. He is the Lion of Judah, and he is the sacrificial lamb. He is the rock, the door, the way, the word, the true vine, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, friend. This is who Jesus is. This is who we worship. This is who we get to worship. When we sing, when we reflect on who Jesus is, we, got, we get to know, wow, you are so big, and yet you are so personal. And as we reflect on all of these aspects, all these different things that, that Jesus is, we, can, we, get, we tend to grow in this place of, of understanding, and our hearts expand into more of, of why we worship him. I think of Isaiah in the Old Testament where he says when he comes in front of and he confronts, he confronts God in a vision, he goes, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Back in the Old Testament when, when uh, people were confronted with God, they were scared to death because they were afraid, I'm going to die. He's big. He's vast. And people were scared to death. When Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt and they were going to Mount Sinai and, and, and God invited all of Israel to come up to the mountain, every single one of his people. But they said, no, 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 we'll just send Moses as a representative. It's too big, too scary. We don't want to go there. How many of us are in this place today where we're going, I don't know if I can worship God like that. I don't know if I can worship the creator of all things like that. I, it's just, it's too big. It's too much. But this is the gift that we can bring is our worship, and we need to worship Jesus for who he is. The second thing is, is that we worship Jesus for what he has done. What has he done for us? In 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, let me read this to you guys today. Pulling out my Bible so I can read from this rather than from this, but it's up on the screens too. So, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. He has saved us and called us to his holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He has destroyed death and brought life. What has he done for us? He has saved us from eternal separation from God the Father forever and ever and ever. He saved us from a broken relationship with himself. Do you know him today? It might be difficult to worship, because, to worship him because you might not know him. And I just I want to encourage you with, with this because it's okay to be in a place of exploring who Jesus is and what he has done for us. You know, I, I got to tell you that, that I first gave my life to the Lord when I was five. My dad prayed for me. We were watching Ben-Hur. I just was really impressed by this movie and its, and its special effects at the time. And uh, I was so moved by what Jesus did that uh, I wanted to give my life to, I wanted to pray and ask Jesus into my life because I wanted to be uh, freed of my sin. Now, growing up in a Christian home, my dad got to pray with me and stuff. For the longest time, my faith, my salvation, my, my, my relationship with Jesus was really uh, based upon my parents' relationship with Jesus. For a long time, when people would say, well, are you a Christian? Like, well, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a Christian church. I probably am, am Christian. And uh, it was only when I got into high school that my, my faith became my own. This relationship, this understanding of what Jesus did for me before high school, it was just like, yeah, you know, this is great. I, I, I've got fire insurance, you know. I'm, I'm saved. 
through grace, you know, I'm, I'm saved and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven. But it was when I really started to realize the grace that Jesus had for me. The grace that he said, regardless of what you've done, Mark, regardless of the thoughts that you've had, regardless of the actions that you've done, I still love you. Regardless of the choices that you've made, I still love you. And I will continue to love you, no matter what. When I started to realize that, something started to change in my life. Kind of talk about it being, you know, I had a lot of head knowledge. I understood a lot about who Jesus was up here. But man, when it traveled that 18 inches down to here, something changed in me. It was, it was, a, it was a transformational situation. Now, does that mean that, that, that my life uh, just was, was flipped and all things just got, got crazy? No, it was something that, that internally, there were new things that, that began to take place in my heart. I, I gotta tell you that I, I started to understand what love was. And it might be that that this is something that happened to you. When you started to give your life over to the Lord, when you started to realize that grace in your own life, maybe you started to realize how to love other people because God loved you. You might have been in a situation in your life where you were just so angry all the time. It's just, just raging. But you gave your life over to the Lord. You realized that grace and it that grace was poured out on your life, and all of a sudden, there was joy that started to come into your life. A different kind of joy. I'm not talking about happiness, but I'm talking about something that was inside of you that you could find um, the, 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 the light in a dark place. That even though the circumstances of your life were still hard, were still frustrating, you could still find joy. Maybe you were anxious and worried all the time, stressing out about every little thing, worrying about your, your parents and, and what were going to happen to them, or maybe you were worrying about your relationship with your spouse, or maybe you were worrying about your job or, or what was going on, and, and you're worrying, worrying, and being anxious about everything, having a hard time breathing, having just panic attacks, all of that stuff, but then you started to give your life over to the Lord, and you realized a new peace and found a peace through Jesus. I don't know if you're catching on to what I'm sharing here. I've talked about love, joy, peace. Maybe there's some things in your life that have been happening where you just didn't have or feel like you had any control. But through the Lord, through that relationship that you have with Him, now all of a sudden you're finding that self-control. There's fruits of the Spirit that can happen in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These things come when we have a relationship with Jesus. It is the fruit that is released in our lives. It is not something that we try to to manufacture. We can't just go, oh, I want to be loving. That's not how it works. We're not just going to, 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 to try to drum up kindness. But through this relationship that we have with Jesus, from this place of having all this head knowledge to allowing that to be transformative in our hearts, now all of a sudden we recognize who Jesus is and what he has done. Jesus died for me. He started in this humble place, born in a, in a stable and, and, and placed in a manger with, with, with swaddling clothes, with just wrapped in, in, in pieces of cloth. This humble beginning of the one who said, let there be light, right? Amazing, humble beginnings. And 33 years later, he is not fighting. He is not calling for, for an assembly of armies against Rome. He is not talking about how to crush the oppression of the Pharisees. No, instead, he was allowing himself to be placed on a cross to die for you and for me so that we could have a second chance at life. Did you realize, do you realize that every breath you take is more grace that Jesus is pouring out on you right now? That every time you blink your eyes, there is, there, is, there is a love letter from the Lord saying, I love you. I love you. 
I died for you. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I went on the cross for you. I love you no matter what. Does that kind of change your approach to worship? Does that change your approach to how you reflect on Christ? Does that change your um, posture? When you worship, and I'm talking about singing now, when you sing to the Lord, is your posture like this? Or maybe through a softening of your heart is it becoming more like this? When we begin to worship Jesus for who he is, when we begin to worship Jesus for what he's done, it changes our heart. We recognize what he did for us. It can break something in us in a positive way. Thirdly, Thirdly, we worship Jesus for what he will do. I think about when the Magi came. You know, here they are uh, coming, and they are uh, presenting these gifts. And I'm like, this is great, but, but why did they come? They, they, they came worshiping forward in their faith. They didn't just do it for the moment, because this, this little baby, it's like, Yes, he is the, the son of God, but he's not, you know, as a baby going, hey, thanks, guys. Really appreciate you coming down this far. Glad you're here tonight. He's not doing that. He's crying. He's pooping his pants. You know, I mean, he's doing what every baby does, right? This is Jesus born as a baby, all right? This is, this is, but they were coming, worshiping forward in their faith. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. There are times in our lives, guys, where we need to worship forward. The circumstances where we find ourselves right now might be just rotten. We might find ourselves in a really hard place in life. We might be struggling with some serious, serious stuff. We find our circumstances hard right now. We find the, 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 the curses that are being poured over us in our lives really difficult and we're really struggling in those hard moments. And it is tough. And we are trying sometimes to manufacture that fruit because we're going, I know, I know that you bring kindness. I know that you bring gentleness. I know that you bring love and joy and peace, God, but oh, I want some of that right now. And sometimes we need to worship forward, believing that God will do these things, that Jesus will, will bring about this, this in a, to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. It goes on to say, according to his power, that is the work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We worship forward, knowing that God will do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. We can walk in faith, trusting that the Lord will do this in us. Do this. As we continue to worship, as we continue to grow in that, in that place of faith with him. A pastor shared this story that, uh, that, that just totally made sense to me. And, and he's talked about the idea of keeping your fork. I don't know if you grew up in, in, you know, having a big Christmas dinner together with all of your family. I did, um, and, and my grandma actually did this. You know, we'd, we'd have this amazing meal. We'd, we'd have the, the whole spread, you know, the, the, all the food, all the, the fixings, you know. The, we did a turkey dinner for, for Christmas a lot of times, at, like, like Thanksgiving, and my grandma liked giblets. So we even had all the, the, the nasty stuff on there, too. <laughs> You know, but we had the spread, okay? We had the good food. We had the good mashed potatoes and all the stuffing and all of the great, the great things. And then she'd be, cleaning up the, she'd be cleaning up the table. We'd all be cleaning up, and she would say, keep your fork. Keep your fork. And this was the best thing when she said this. This was code. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys are going, oh, I know what's coming. Yeah. We're talking apple pie. 
with the big, huge scoop of vanilla ice cream, the real vanilla ice cream. You know what I'm talking about with the little chunks of vanilla inside of it, just, you know, and just on top of that hot, awesome, crispy, crusted apple pie just melting on top of it. Oh, it was so good. Save your fork because the best is yet to come. I want to encourage you today, spiritually, save your fork. Press through the struggle that you're finding yourself in because the best is yet to come. And I'm not just talking about your best life. Like, I, 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 I am escaping the guy that says your best life now, whatever that pastor is. It uh, uh, doesn't matter. Osteen. Yeah, I'm talking about beyond that even, that we get to spend eternity with Christ forever and ever and ever beyond all things. Eternity forever. We get to hang out with him. The one who said, I love you so much, I will die for you. We get to spend the rest of eternity with him. How amazing is this? I hope you are grasping my heart in sharing this today. My prayer is that for, for those of us that are walking this in this head knowledge, this cerebral place of worshiping Christ, that you are actually, it is starting to, to sink down and melt and just ooze like that ice cream down into your heart. Because the best is yet to come for all of us. The love that we are experiencing now, the best is yet to come. The joy that we experience now, the best is yet to come. The peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the best is yet to come. May you, this Christmas season, worship Jesus in a whole new way. May you find this amazing love. And in all those ways that I talked about, that Scripture talks about who Jesus is, there's way more. I just kind of picked some of the highlights, but there was over 50. So to encourage you guys today. In view of Christ, of who he is, of what he's done, and what he will do, today I want to encourage you, the gift that you bring him is yourself. Bring him you. That's what he wants. More than anything else, the gift of you to Jesus. And your worship, bring you. Come to him in your weariness and he'll give you rest. This Christmas, we can all use some rest, amen? It gets busy. But he just wants you simply every day. We just get to talk about it a little bit more today in this season. It says in Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is more than a song. Worship is more than hands being raised. Worship is more than a service. Worship is coming before the Lord with you and saying, I love you. Can we do that this Christmas? Can we come before the Lord and just say, I love you? I worship him. Would you stand with me? I'd like to close in prayer this morning and just uh, give thanks for all of you. And just pray, pray, pray a blessing over you this morning. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship. This opportunity to sing to you. This opportunity, God, daily to live for you. To acknowledge the grace that you pour out over us every day, every moment of every day. With every breath we breathe, with every eye blinking that we have, God, you are speaking over us love. You are, you are showering us with your grace. It is the gift that we do not deserve. And I am so very thankful 
Help us all, Lord, to, to, be, uh, to be grateful for these gifts that you bring us. And may we worship you today for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you will do in our lives. Help us, Lord, to stay focused on that in the midst of the busyness and the chaos. Help us to never forget from the humble beginnings to the gruesome death that, 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 you, that you had to the resurrected life that you lived. We love you, Lord. And we just submit ourselves to you in worship, giving you all glory and honor. We praise you. Amen.